we started the holiday lectures a couple of years ago so that graduate students could see some of the best and most exciting scholars in our discipline. And when we raised the possibility of inviting, inviting uh, uh, top scholars to do something special here in the department, everybody sat up and said, yeah, I can think of a few that I would really love to have here. Uh, tonight, you've got, you've got one of the top choices, and we are so delighted to have, to have uh, this event tonight. So let, let me just pass over to Emma Gordon to introduce our speaker. Uh, and, and as I do that, just to stop for one second, we wanted, we wanted to name this series out here JBS Haldane, because Haldane was the kind of polymath that we want to promote in STS, the, the good interdisciplinarian, the cross-disciplinarian, the person interested in everything just because it's interesting, not because it's owned by a certain department. And Haldane, I think, so nicely represents what STS is all about, and also represents what, what tonight's work is all about, too. So there you go. That's why I think this is important. But over to Emma, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I can't promise to be as enthusiastic as Joe, because he is the most enthusiastic person in the world. Uh, but I'll try, and I am very, very enthusiastic to have Helen here um, this evening. She is genuinely one of the most influential philosophers of science, and in particular female philosophers of science in the world. And, I'm, and that is the truth, so I'm, I'm not uh, using superlatives when I say that. Um, Helen is the chair of the philosophy department at Stanford University, so I've got my notes to make sure I've got everything right. But she's not a stranger to London, so she did her MA at the University of Sussex. Um, she has also spent some time at the LSE a little while back um, as a visiting fellow um, in the philosophy department there. Uh, she did her PhD at John Hopkins University, and more recently, so to again give you an example of, of a recent honour, she was the elected president of the Philosophy of Science Association from 2013 to 2014. Um, so just to give you a little bit, I won't talk for too long because I know you really just want to hear what Helen has to say, um, but just to give you a sense of some of the topics that are of extreme interest to us, not just as philosophers in STS, but also to um, the wider um, scholarship that's done here in the department at STS. Um, so, Helen's work has played central stage in highlighting the relevance of social values in the justification of scientific knowledge. So she's really been a, a key figure in that. Um, so very much looking at epistemology of science from not just the philosophy of science perspective, but also from a wider STS um, perspective. Um, so for example, it, she's also contributed widely to STS more widely. Her 2002 book, Fate of Knowledge, offers a central challenge to critiques of philosophy of science from sociology of science. Um, and I think she's a key figure in trying to integrate both philosophy of science and sociology of science. And that's something we're really keen on working towards and doing here at the STS department in London as well. Um, so I think for that reason we're especially excited, not just the philosophy community, but the sociology community um, at STS as well. Um, I think Helen's work is truly interdisciplinary in an STS way, and I think she shows how SDS can be excellently integrated um, and done very, very well. So she's not just a philosopher of science. Now I think she's a key, I mean, she's a great philosopher of science, don't get me wrong, she's also a key uh, SDS figure. So I think a great person for us to showcase um, to our graduate students and to the wider community here as well. So a very, very warm welcome, Helen. Um, I'm gonna leave it over to you. She's gonna speak to us about older determination, an age-old philosophy of science topic but I think from a broader perspective. So thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. For those introductions, I should say, both to Professor Kane and to Professor Tobin. Um, it's really an honor to have been asked to give uh, a lecture named after J.B.S. Haldane. Um, he was a tremendous figure in the history of 20th century biology. Um, and one of the things that's really uh, striking about him is, is his real deep social engagement um, as a scientist. Um, so I feel honored and a little uh, humbled uh, by uh, having been, uh, been invited. Um, so um, under determination, yes, I thought about this uh, a while ago, and it's been um, a leitmotif through a lot of my work, 
um, but I started thinking about it again uh, more recently, and I just like to sort of share the thoughts I've been having um, about it with you tonight. So, oh yes, it's big, big enough. Um, the uh, you know the starting point of problems about evidential relations um, is something like this. In, except in the case of empirical generalizations, um, there are no formal connections between theoretical hypotheses and the empirical data that are brought forward as evidence for them. And that's how the underdetermination problem proper um, gets started. So data acquire their status as evidence for some hypothesis or other in virtue of background assumptions that establish the relevance of the data to the plausibility or acceptability of the hypothesis. Um, that's the problem of underdetermination, data underdetermined hypothesis uh, evaluation. And it's a, a problem that was really brought to the fore, <coughs> or maybe even invented as such, by Pierre Duhem in uh, the early part of the 20th century. Um, UM was followed uh, in thinking about it by uh, people like Willard Van Orman Pine, um, who I'll say a little bit more about all of these, uh, some of these people uh, in a bit, um, who developed uh, his version of uh, the underdetermination thesis, uh, then Jarrett Leplin and Philip Kitcher, um, who both tried to contest the uh, dire uh, potential implications of the underdetermination thesis, Kyle Stanford, uh, who revived it. Um, all of these, I think, share a particular uh, interpretation of what the underdetermination thesis is about. Um, what they share is a holist uh, interpretation, or what I'm calling it, a holist interpretation of underdetermination, uh, which I contrast with a contextualist uh, interpretation of underdetermination. So what I'm going to, what I've been thinking about and what I'm going to talk about is the ways in which eh, efforts, and I'll just focus on the Leplin uh, effort, but efforts to defang underdetermination actually only apply to one interpretation. They apply to this holist interpretation, but not to the contextual interpretation. And um, so I'm going to review some of those arguments. Um, and show that the holist interpretation includes uh, just a subset of uh, underdetermined situations, and then uh, describe um, some new problems, which I think qualify as underdetermination problems in contemporary sciences, um, and then think a little bit critically about uh, solutions that I proposed in a social account of knowledge. Um, so, uh, some thinkers have assimilated the underdetermination problem to the problem of reduction that uh, Hume introduced us to. Um, both, of course, seem to call into question the rational legitimacy of inferring from a limited sample of data to claims that go beyond the sample. But there are different problems. Hume's problem of induction, uh, I should say, <coughs> induction itself still maintains a kind of formal connection between evidence statements and hypotheses. That is, the descriptive terms in evidence or data statements are the same as the descriptive statements in the generalizations to which one infers inductively. So um, we've got a series of uh, observations, A1 is B, uh, A2 is B, A3 is B, through A n, however many there are, and then we make the inductive uh, leap to all, not just the ones which are all A's are B's. And oh, there's been a lot of philosophical attention to working out the details of what inductive inference is, uh, uh, is all about. My point here is uh, just to emphasize that Duhem's form of underdetermination is different. What Duhem was pointing out is that hypotheses are simply not generalizations from data. Hypotheses are about phenomena that are themselves different from the data that we can observe. 
So, uh, Duhem asks us to suppose, um, you know, imagine that a physicist uh, decides to conduct an experimental test of a hypothesis. In order to deduce from this proposition the hypothesis, he says, the prediction of a phenomenon, and to institute the experiment, which is to show whether this phenomenon is or is not produced, the physicist does not confine himself to making use of the proposition in question only. He makes use also of a whole group of theories accepted by him as beyond dispute. So there's something else entering into this uh, inferential uh, process uh, besides the data and the hypothesis for which the data uh, may be taken as evidence. <clears throat> Duhem uh, brings out three consequences uh, of this. Uh, first of all, famously, um, experiments test only a hypothesis uh, H plus assumptions and not a hypothesis alone. So H plus A is that whole group of theories that um, he's referencing in, uh, in his quote. So um, that means that if O is our prediction from H and our experiment results in not O, that is a failure of the expected observation when we perform the experiment, then only H plus A is falsified and not H alone. So that's central to his uh, view. And if we substitute, substitute some uh, other assumption, uh, A prime for A, then the evidential relevance of O to H is not necessarily preserved. So that, that's what I think UM um, was uh, saying and emphasizing. Duhem's uh, solution, so in that, so if, if assumptions are playing this role, then what kind of control do we have over the assumptions that we're going to allow into the process? And Duhem's answer was, well, is the physicist's full sense or good sense? Well, that feels a little empty. It's very unsatisfactory anyway. Besides, your good sense and my good sense may be quite different. So. That's, that's not, going to, not going to work. Um, Duhem's uh, problem here, I think, took back seat in philosophy of science to the um, uh, kinds of innovations that the logical empiricists were introducing from the 20s uh, on through, um, and uh, wasn't revived really until, I think, Fine took it up in, from a logical point of view. Um, and what Quine did, if one's thinking uncharitably, one might think that Quine hijacked uh, Duhem's problem uh, in service of his own views about the web of belief. Um, so for Quine, um, a phenomenon that uh, contradicts a prediction or expectation doesn't confront a single hypothesis or even a single theory and now not just an hypothesis plus some assumptions, but rather the whole web of belief. So Quine has this view, I think, of um, our belief system being essentially a coherent system, a system of coherent uh, beliefs. And when something uh, is introduced, for example, into our field of experience that is um, incoherent, inconsistent with that, that web, we have a problem. Um, and for Quine, because the web, everything in the web is connected, there is no single optimal way to adjust the web in order to accommodate the uh, recalcitrant, as he calls it, experience. We can adjust in many uh, different ways and uh, incorporate that into the web of belief. That's what came to be known as the do and Quine thesis. And as the Duhem Quine thesis, it became understood as this view, namely that for any theory, 
however well supported uh, by the evidence it may be, it's possible to construct a different but empirically equivalent theory, where empirical equivalence means having exactly the same empirical consequences. Um, so an example would be, for example, um, the postulation of a universal force, such as Weichenbach talked about. Um, uh, how do we tell uh, the difference between uh, T versus T, sorry, or T for uh, 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 Newtonian mechanics? How do we tell the difference between Newtonian, Newtonian mechanics and uh, Newtonian mechanics supplemented by this postulation of a universal force, um, which makes no difference in the experienced world? Um, well, we can't, because they have exactly the same empirical consequences. And actually, um, uh, Nicholas Maxwell uh, of UCL uh, had a somewhat more ingenious uh, proposal um, uh, that one can construct um, an aberrant theory uh, T prime um, that's alternative to T, along with some aberrant evidence uh, E prime that includes but goes beyond the evidence for T, and where the evidence E, e prime isn't something that we'll actually have access to, uh, to determine. So, T and T prime are evidentially equivalent in that they account for, uh, e e equivalently account for um, uh, their, their phenomena. And so one cannot appeal to any empirical source to decide between them. Okay. So, how can one justify accepting a theory T over uh, T plus U, or T over T prime, or T plus U, accepting T plus U, as opposed to T, or T prime, as opposed to T? Well, um, this twist on underdetermination, this empirical equivalence uh, move, I think, moves attention away from issues of data and their evidential relevance to focus on issues of theory. In the holist interpretation of underdetermination, given any scientific theory, it's possible to construct an empirically equivalent alternative theory, uh, that is, one that has exactly the same empirical consequences, or in Maxwell's uh, formulation, um, uh, a, an, uh, a theory that is uh, uh, equivalently um, empirically supported. Um, no purely empirical considerations are going to be sufficient to decide between them. That's, that's the point here. Now, so that's what, what philosophers um, who took underdetermination seriously and thought it was a problem uh, <coughs> took it upon themselves to uh, defang. And I think one of the, uh, uh, there, there are a couple of ways of, of defanging. Um, I'll just mention, um, uh, Kitcher's uh, strategy, which is to um, try to argue that any genuine cases of um, uh, underdetermination are really cases where you have uh, just a different interpretation of the same formalism. So really nothing very much changes. We just change the interpretation that we did with the formalism, whether we're talking about particles or, or uh, um, uh, or, or, or waves, that is the kind of physical interpretation, but the formalism remains the same, and the formalism is what counts. Um, so there is no other because the formalism itself uh, remains. That's, that was Kitcher's, uh, uh, Kitcher's view, and about that one can say, well, not all cases of underdetermination have this character. They're not just all about the interpretation of science to uh, formula. Um, Loudon and uh, Lepland in their paper on empirical equivalence and other determination um, uh, have a, a more intriguing uh, uh, effort at uh, defanging under determination. And uh, according to them, properly understood the thesis of empirical equivalence loses all significance for epistemology. So, once we understand uh, empirical equivalence, 
our concerns about underdetermination will evaporate. How do they do that? So um, they uh, base their argument on what they take to be three generally accepted propositions. Um, one is the variability of the range of the observable, namely that what is observable at any given time changes in time. What was observable to Galileo is uh, not what is observable to us now. And what was observable to Galileo is not what was observable to the uh, cosmologist working before him because Galileo had a telescope. <coughs> Or his telescope. No one saw the shadows of Venus, no one saw the mountains of the moon, uh, the rings of Jupiter, or the moons of Jupiter, I should say. So what we can see depends on uh, the state of scientific knowledge or the state of scientific instrumentation um, at any, any given time. Um, secondly, obvious to everyone, they say, the need for auxiliaries and predictions. That is, the need for additional information to derive observable consequences from a hypothesis. Well, actually, we already saw that in, in UM. So how is, how is this going to undo underdetermination, you might ask. Um, thirdly, um, uh, the, the third generally accepted proposition is the instability of auxiliary assumptions, namely, Auxiliary assumptions are both defeasible, they can be shown false, um, and um, augmentable, that is, they can be um, uh, uh, added to to accommodate um, uh, new observations. So, um, Auxiliary assumptions are also going to be uh, relative to the state of scientific knowledge at a time. This means that um, there's no purely uh, logical or conceptual argument that can show that the condition of empirical equivalence, as it might be identified in the moment, is a permanent condition. Of course, you might know to yourself. Of course, it also means that the condition of most highly supported uh, hypothesis could be evidence is also not a permanent uh, condition. That too, that too can change. So, for Loudon and Leffler, given that there's no logical or conceptual argument that can show that the condition of empirical equivalence is permanent, the global problem of underdetermination is defeated because underdetermination will always be, I mean, can never be known to be not temporary because everything that constructs the underdetermination situation can change. What actually counts as data, the auxiliaries that are employed uh, to support the reasoning between <coughs> data and hypotheses can also change. Um, so those were two kinds of arguments, Kitcher's and Loudon's and Leplin's uh, arguments to, um, to undermine <coughs> underdetermination as a problem. Um, but uh, underdetermination was revived uh, recently by Kyle Stanford in his book, Exceeding Our Grasp. Um, and for him, uh, underdetermination is what he calls the problem of unconceived alternatives. And he bases his argument on three case studies of uh, <coughs> biology in the 19th century. Um, Darwin, he says, um, ignored alternatives to his theory of pangenesis, even when they were presented to him. Uh, Galton uh, ignored uh, alternatives to his theory of invariant uh, particulate inheritance. Weismann um, 
uh, ignored alternatives to um, uh, his view that there were specific uh, intracellular uh, determinants of specific characters. There were alternatives, Stanford says, uh, to these views at the time that uh, Darwin, Galton, and Weisman were propounding their own views, um, alternatives that in some cases they knew about, but in all three cases at least, had, uh, had or could have as much uh, evidential support as the theories that uh, their proponents, uh, that, that Darwin, Galton, and uh, Weisman had. Uh, for, for theirs. Um, so, Stanford says, if there were realistic, that is, the theories that made sense, made sense in light of the evidence uh, that was available, um, uh, at least some people had uh, thought of these ideas, if there were alternatives then, how do we know the same uh, isn't true for us now? That is, there may be alternatives to the theories we take to be highly confirmed that we just haven't thought of, or that it presented to us we decide to ignore, as Darwin ignored, uh, alternatives to angenesis. So, contrary to Lowry and Leplin, or Stanford, under determination as the existence of alternative and incompatible theories supported by the available evidence persists as a fundamental aspect of our epistemological condition. So, there are three things to say about this uh, very potted history of under determination in the 20th century philosophy of science. Um, from Quine to Stanford, uh, it seems to me, the concern is with under determination as it bears on questions of scientific Realism or anti-realism. That's what they're really concerned about. Can we be can we be realists or must we be anti-realists or can we be anti-realists or must we be realists? Like that's, that's what they're really worried about. Um, Stanford's approach is, I think, still theory-centered. It's still holist because he's thinking about he's, he's sort of driven by this consideration of alternatives to um, to theories. Um, and interestingly, the basic structure of Stanford's argument is very similar to that of Loudon and left them. We don't know how science will change in the future. We don't know now uh, how it's going to change. We don't know what we're overlooking uh, in the moment. Um, for Loudon and Levin, it's the ways in which evidence may accumulate. Uh, but for Stanford, um, it's the way in which ideas that are available to us now may, 20 or 50 years from now, uh, become the lingua franca of the discipline that we're um, thinking about. In the words of a former uh, Secretary of Defense in the United States, we do not know what we do not know. <laughs> Wiser words were never spoken. <laughs> I wish they'd been attended to, but. Um, so, um, I think what Stanford's argument shows is that Loudon and Leplin's strategy is for defeating underdetermination is at best inconclusive because you can use the same premises for exactly the opposite conclusion. So, uh, underdetermination as a claim about the persistence of uh, empirical equivalence or something like it uh, into the future remains um, a possibility. Um, but even so, um, this holist interpretation, which I think uh, can still persist, includes only a subset of underdetermination situations. Um, and uh, I'll say that, I think, really quickly. Um, if we focus on scientific practice, and not on theories as, as entities that exist independently of the practices of researchers who uh, work with them, who come up with them, work with them, and so forth, um, the questions of underdetermination arise from the examination of particular episodes of scientific investigation. What I um, argued in my 1990 book, and I, I have to confess that when I wrote that, I, I, I hadn't read you in. So. <laughs> um, I, I always make it a point now to reference you when I talk about underdetermination. Um, 
So um, what I was uh, arguing is that there's a semantic gap between descriptions of single observations uh, or sets of observations that serve as data and the hypotheses that the data are taken to support when these are categorically articulated. Um, so what are some examples of uh, underdetermination in this sense? Well, um, uh, patterns of tracks and cloud chambers or uh, sequences of ciphers on, on data tapes and claims about the behavior of elementary particles. Or patterns of hemoglobin oxygenation and deoxygenation in brain tissue as measured by a magnetic resonance imaging and claims about specific uh, mind-brain activity. Uh, or uh, seismic measurements, which are made uh, of movement on the surface of the Earth, uh, and claims about the Earth's deep structure. Now, researchers, scientists have a name for uh, many of these. They call these inverse problems. And they tell you how they're going to solve their inverse problems. But inverse problems are a species of underdetermination problems. So, um, and they're going to solve inverse problems by bringing a little idea from here, a little idea from there, and working it all out. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But as philosophers, I think we want to pay attention to this, what's going on. So, um, to call something an inverse problem is not to eliminate the underdetermination that it uh, represents. Okay. So here, underdetermination isn't the possibility of multiple empirically equivalent theories, but rather um, problems of fixing the evidential relevance of experimental and observational data, that is, determining that the data are evidence for something, and evaluating the background assumptions that facilitate such fixing. So um, there's nothing wrong with relying on background assumptions, but we need to make them um, uh, more visible and be able to evaluate them somehow. Um, and that's what I call the contextualist interpretation of underdetermination. Each evidence hypothesis relationship is mediated by background assumptions. Those background assumptions form the context uh, for uh, evidence hypothesis relationships. And I think this is really uh, closer to Duhem's original formulation. Um, so I'll just repeat that. There's a time I won't go through it again, but I see people nodding, so I'm going to agree. Good. <coughs> okay. So now um, I want to talk uh, about some um, underdetermination problems in contemporary sciences. And um, I'll have more to say about the first. Um, uh, the, uh, because I've worked on at least one uh, aspect of that. The second and third uh, are um, areas where I think um, underdetermination um, is, has a, gives us an interesting angle to uh, think about um, what's going on, but they represent areas that I still have to do more thinking about. But I'll throw them out and they have uh, things to say. Um, so, uh, complexity. Um, so the complex phenomenon, or the study of the complex phenomenon that I looked at, is um, the uh, study of behavior, in particular the study of human behavior. Any behavior um, is, is a complex phenomenon. Um, organisms operate uh, in environments. Organisms themselves are complex uh, entities composed of um, different kinds of tissues, different organs, uh, that work in concert um, uh, and that enable the organism to manipulate and move around in its environment. Um, its environment determines features of the organism, and so there's a, a very complex back and forth relationship between organism uh, and environment. When we come to try to understand um, human behavior, um, we have to find some kind of angle. That is, we have to uh, uh, utilize some kind of approach to studying the problem. And um, 
in the study that, uh, uh, that I did, um, I looked at uh, a number of uh, different approaches. Um, I looked at quantitative behavior genetics, molecular behavior genetics, uh, neurophysiology and anatomy, uh, social environment oriented developmental psychology, and others, ways that uh, efforts to integrate those and uh, some others as well. When you read papers in these uh, disciplines all together, you, know, you see that there can be multiple causal factors that can be investigated, multiple causal factors in behavior that uh, are the subject of investigation. So I came up with this grid. It can be you know, added to as more factors are uh, incorporated or as we make uh, uh, differentiations uh, among these factors. Um, ranging from uh, uh, genotype as allele pairs to genotype as whole genome, uh, all the way out to uh, uh, major uh, macro environmental features such as socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic status. Now, there isn't any approach that studies all of these and their interactions. Instead, researchers, disciplines are constructed around the different factors. So geneticists are going to look at um, genetic variation and the correlations of genetic variation with behavioral variation. Um, uh, neuroscientists, the neurophysiologists or neuroanatomists are going to look at um, uh, variation in uh, brain structures and uh, correlation of brain structures and brain functions uh, and attempt to correlate those with, um, with behavioral uh, variation. Um, researchers looking uh, at environmental factors um, uh, talk both about both the non-shared environment and uh, shared environment, uh, non-shared environment. Uh, they're still talking about um, looking at uh, individuals who've been raised in the same uh, setting, but uh, uh, they vary in, uh, in behavior, so like variations in the non-shared environment, correlated variations in behavior in the non-shared environment can be things like uh, birth order or differential parental attention. Any of us who've grown up with multiple siblings know that our parents pay different kinds of attention to different ones of us. Um, and for some of us it's a benefit and for some of us it's not. Um, and some of us go on talking about this with our siblings forever. <laughs> Um, okay, so that's non-shared environment. Um, <laughs> um, uh, shared environment is th are things that are uh, 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 sort of shared within the uh, environment of rearing. Uh, so parental attitudes, very discipline. And attitudes, of course, are different from practices. So parents may say one thing, but actually do another. Uh, so those with the attitudes would be shared. Communication styles, uh, whether uh, an environment is abusive or non-abusive. Um, of course, these are things that are difficult to, to measure, but there are strategies for, for measuring them and then way out uh, to a broader environment to uh, features of socioeconomic status. Okay, so, so these are all things that one can look at, but, but it takes different disciplinary tools to um, identify um, what's going on in any of these blocks, right? So, you know, the geneticist is not really going to know a whole heck of a lot about how to measure um, features of shared or even non-shared uh, environment of mirror. Similarly, the psychologist, developmental psychologist, is not going to know a whole heck of a lot about how to uh, work with DNA. So, in conducting their research, they're focusing on the objects that they have the tools to investigate. So that space of possible causes or potential causes um, gets reduced 
to the space of causes that the researcher has the tools to investigate, or that the research community has the tools to investigate. And of course, it, you know, correlations are never going to be complete between variation in the uh, uh, so-called causal phenomena or the independent variable and um, variation in the phenomenon uh, being investigated, behavior, or the dependent uh, variable. So there's always going to be a category of, uh, of, of uh, there's always going to be a portion of the sample under study that is not uh, fully um, correlatable or explained by um, the uh, uh, independent uh, variation in the independent variable. Um, and when we move to a different research approach, the con the, the uh, the same thing happens, namely we'll have researchers looking at um, various aspects of physiology, hormone secretory patterns, neurotransmitter metabolism, and so forth, and there will be features, or, uh, a portion of the sample under study that kind of remains unexplained um, in any any study, we can attribute that to uh, whatever, but the, of course, these are uh, going to be different. Um, and um, the size of other in any of these studies is not going to be. Uh, the summation of the uh, causal patterns we found using a different approach. So the other, when we're studying physiology, um, is not going to be uh, the genotype. The other is not going to be social influences. Right? Um, so there's no additive relationship um, here among the different categories of the correlation that we can find between, say, genomic and behavioral data is um, only evidence for a hypothesis about the particular degree of influence of the genetic variation and the behavioral variation in light of an assumption that no other types of factor are operating, that is, in light of assumption that the causal parsing um, is correct, that they have accurately fixed on the set of, um, of, uh, of uh, independent variables or possible causes um, uh, that uh, will be playing, that, that we can suppose to play a causal role in the <coughs> in variation. Same is true for any of the factors uh, in that sequence of, uh, of boxes because the causal factors that each approach investigates are different. Each is going to assume a different causal parsing. So another way of putting, putting this is that um, if we go back um, to this grid, as it turns out, when you read some of the papers, it turns out that some things that go in, in, uh, in one grid uh, one part of the grid for one approach, go in another part of the grid for another approach. So um, it's, we, we, can't, we simply can't combine uh, these studies into one uh, big coherent uh, uh, single, single theory. So um, <coughs> and, and there isn't an empirical investigative method that's going to compare factors from different causal pairings. Um, so there can't be an empirical argument to the empirical superiority of one of the approaches over the others. Um, and instead, we're uh, faced with uh, a variety of different approaches, which taken all together may provide some understanding of the 
of the complexity of behavior of uh, may provide understanding that different factors are playing uh, a causal role, but in terms of understanding precisely in a, in a nice, clean, quantitative way what's going on, um, we're not able to do that because we can't combine the, uh, the approaches. So, each approach is selecting what's relevant from a complex set of interacting factors. These factors all, all, all interact, um, but each approach is just focusing on one portion uh, of the uh, factors that are uh, uh, interacting. So background assumptions um, are determining um, what, the, what data are going to be counted as evidence for um, a given approach and also establish the relevance of those data to the hypotheses under investigation. And what makes this under determination? And you might say, well, maybe these are just multiple independent uh, investigations studying different phenomena, but the phenomena are, in the actual world, inseparable. You can't separate the organism from the environment in which it, in which it is, nor can we sort of separate the environment from the uh, organism that, uh, that inhabits it. There's lots more to be said about, uh, about this case. What I, what I would say um, is I, I think um, many complex phenomena are going to be like behavior in that it will take multiple disciplines to really understand those phenomena. But um, it's not clear. I mean, and we can't know a priori. So I can't say a priori that every case will be exactly like, like this one. But it takes investigation of the relationship uh, among these uh, disciplinary approaches, how they're constructing uh, their uh, investigative uh, setups, uh, and so on, to, to, to know whether they have this same character of uh, uh, partiality and, and pluralism uh, uh, or not. So we have to actually look at uh, the theories. We can't determine this by, by the standing back. And, um, <coughs> Behavioral situation may be uh, an outlier, but it may also be typical. I kind of suspect it's more typical than not. It's more work for philosophers to do. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was uh, complexity. So now I'm going to say uh, uh, some uh, briefer, uh, make some briefer remarks about the two other areas that I think are really important for philosophers to, um, uh, to think about. And that has to do with um, uh, statistical data first, uh, statistical data and, uh, and hypotheses. So what, um, one of the things that got me thinking about all this again is um, the realization that um, all of our data are statistical. Now, evidence is statistical in character. Um, either uh, we're using uh, um, uh, uh, an array of statistical data, or if we're using a single, uh, a, a single observation, a data point, that acquires its significance against a background of statistical information. Um, so, what do you say? Show me that, show me that this now. <laughs> but thinking about evidence in the way that I did, I was focused on on on, uh, on single observations and uh, the ways in which they could be understood as, as evidence. And I think a lot of philosophers also did. I think we really underestimated the importance of thinking about statistics in uh, in the sciences. So um, I'll just say a few words about where I think um, statistics. Uh, it exemplifies uh, this, uh, this kind of contextualist underdetermination. So, all right, evidence isn't a single data point, but it's an array uh, of data and um, or a set of measurements. And again, if you uh, 
uh, you look at the literature, you're going to see that different episodes of measurement are going to yield slightly or even grossly different sets of measurements, licensing different statistical hypotheses about the phenomenon. Um, so maybe I came to this partly because of a case study that I was just uh, just describing, where I looked at a lot of statistical uh, studies and um, of studies about the relationship between uh, uh, genomic variation and depression. And statistical estimates are all over the place, depending on the study. So you just get all kinds of estimates uh, about the relation of um, so there, there, and there are different kinds of studies, right? There's a, a, a study that just focuses on things like familial uh, uh, transmission. Uh, uh, but there are studies that also try to associate um, a particular uh, uh, allelic profile uh, with, uh, with depression. And there again, you find um, uh, results that are statistically all over the place. Um, so what's the solution? Well, um, and this is true kind of in, in most, for most t statistical studies. So meta-analysis, of course, is supposed to be the solution to this. Meta-analysis being the strategy to um, pool statistical studies um, uh, in order to come up with um, uh, a, uh, a true value, ideally. Um, uh, well, meta-analysis, of course, uh, um, doesn't just take all the studies uh, together and apply some simple averaging uh, algorithm um, because some studies are better than others, some have larger samples than others, um, some use different methodologies. So a meta-analysis has to have specific criteria of inclusion, whether they're included in the study, um, or they have to have criteria of uh, quality and uh, comparability. And um, in any case, the measurement data that uh, are uh, incorporated in the different studies that are going to be subjected to a meta-analysis are themselves indexed to the system that's used to generate the data, um, the uh, instruments that are used, the study population, and, uh, and so forth. Um, so uh, meta-analysis doesn't solve the problem of multiple um, statistical estimates for the same um, for the same relationship. Um, uh, meta analysis itself um, uh, has to, the criteria that are being used to determine infusibility or not, uh, quality, and so forth, um, constitute assumptions uh, that. Uh, determine the uh, meta-analysis uh, itself. The second um, uh, point here is um, that the idea that somehow meta-analysis is supposed to get us, ideally get us to the true, the true value, um, well, that supposes that there is a true value, that really, that there is a correct frequency, rather, than just random fluctuation. So all those studies with different numbers might be correct for those populations, and there might not be a single value uh, across um, the whole uh, variety of uh, populations. So it may be that, that uh, variability and fluctuation are the story of nature, rather than um, uh, uh, single correct uh, frequencies. So that's another way, I think, there's an assumption, assumption going on here that um, we need to think about. Uh, yeah. Right. So that's what that was about. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to say nothing about uh, computer modeling and uh, and simulation, except to point out that that modeling practices rely on arguments from analogy, um, and so modeling is only as good as the analogy uh, that, uh, that generates it. So, I'll say that.
Oh, gosh. All right, no. Hmm. I really want to get to a conclusion. Pardon? It's okay. Take some. All right, I'll, I'll try to do this quickly. So, um, in, uh, in my uh, earlier books, um, I proposed critical contextual empiricism as a way to deal with uh, underdetermination. Um, from the perspective of traditional individualist epistemology, it seemed to me the underdetermination problem undermines the credibility of scientific claims because we have assumptions that, at least some of which, will not be empirically determinable. Some will, but some won't. Um, um, so it looks as though the background assumptions are arbitrary. And the problem with, with taking the individual as the unit of knowledge is that it neglects the ingredient of criticism. You know, I'm not the first person to talk about the importance of criticism. I know that. Um, but I think the way that um, uh, incorporating it into epistemology, I think, is really um, uh, important. And um, the kind of criticism that I think is, is key is uh, subjecting background assumptions to criticism from multiple points of view. So that there has to be a diversity of perspectives in the scientific community or available to the scientific community um, uh, to enable effective critical interaction. If we all have the same basic ideas, then there's, there's, there's no way that those ideas are going to be uh, subject to uh, critical examination, which enables us to um, either re-endorse the assumptions uh, to reject the assumptions, to modify them, but it's criticism that makes them available for uh, that kind of examination. Um, and criticism does so, I argue, when um, uh, it observes uh, certain norms. I'll say about these uh, at the, uh, oh yeah, so I don't even talk about them here. Certain norms. Uh, I proposed a bunch of norms. They may not be the norms. All I want to really insist on is that uh, community interactions have to satisfy some norms or other in that the, to make the critical interaction that happens actually genuinely interactive and genuinely transformative, that is to, to produce um, uh, change. Um, but um, coming back to issues that I proposed in my uh, uh, abstract. Does this solution save the cognitive authority of science? If there's no guarantee that non-arbitrariness in method, that is, if we have uh, 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 a broad survival of uh, hypothesis, or theory, or model uh, from a broad uh, range of criticism, that makes it non-arbitrary in some sense. It's not just plucked out of thin air. Uh, it's not imposed by uh, the more powerful members of the community, as long as the community follows the norms that I, have, uh, that I, that I set out. Um, but if there's no guarantee that non-arbitrariness in method uh, results in accurate or true uh, representations of the phenomenon we seek to understand, why should we accept uh, the results of that um, investigation? So we may be assured that it's not arbitrary, not imposed by power, but do we have any assurance that Correct. Um, well, one could ask, but is there anything better? Mm -hmm. That was a uh, question back. Um, but I also think that we need to revise our understandings of success. I think we've been beguiled by a vision of truth um, and a kind of correspondent sense of truth. And the elusiveness of that um, uh, is part of what makes the undetermination problem seem so um, difficult and puzzling. So in my 2002, I proposed a new account of epistemic uh, appraisal um, under the rubric of semantic success. Semantic success means hooking up with the world in some way or other, but not necessarily as a mirroring, mirroring representation. Um, uh, and um, truth, at least as conventionally understood, it seems to me is too narrow. Um, an expression of uh, epistemic evaluation of semantic success because we have I mean, just just one argument. Truth uh, 
is a concept that applies to propositions uh, or linguistic uh, entities of some kind. And we use lots of other kinds of representation in science. We use mathematical models, we use uh, diagrammatic models, all, all kinds of implementations, not just propositional statements, not just the cat is on the map. It's uh, much more complicated. And I think the cat on the map can be true or false. It really does depend on whether the cat's on the map. <laughs> I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that. It's just that science is about more than, than the cat we can determine to be there. Um, so I propose conformation, which uh, includes truth as a limiting uh, uh, definition, but also things like approximation, fit, similarity, isomorphism, holomorphism, uh, calibration, and so on. And the point of introducing these, um, or one point, is to see that uh, there isn't any simple uh, relationship here that can be um, uh, evaluated just by looking at the representation of what we seek to, to represent. Rather, conformation is going to be evaluated um, relative to the degree of, uh, say, similarity or approximation or whatever that is sought, and um, with respect to and um, uh, variation in respect. That is, do we want similarity, fit, or isomorphism with respect to which properties of the complex phenomenon that we're looking at? So I think conformation is a, is a better or this family of, of terms uh, is, is, a, is a better um, outcome to be looking for than, than simple truth. Any complex phenomenon has many aspects, and we may only be interested in or able to access, access a subset of those aspects. Um, and it's no, no uh, deficit of an approach that it is partial in this sense. It conforms um, as long as it conforms uh, to some to some degree. Um, in evaluating conformation, um, the degree and respect in which conformation is sought uh, have to be specified. Um, it's not just an after the fact. Um, we got this far, so this is good. No, we specify. Um, and um, the specification is going to be a function of the reasons for which the knowledge is sought, the reasons for which our representation is sought, that is, of the goals of our inquiry. And specifying the kind of confirmation that's sought is going to be an outcome of trade-offs that we make between uh, additional uh, goals or additional desiderata, for example, uh, trade-offs between precision and applicability. Sometimes the more precise the representation is, the less applicable uh, it is, and the less conversation is possible to have um, across, across disciplines. Determination of degrees and respect has to be determined socially. That is, it has to be a community decision. Otherwise, how are we going to hold ourselves accountable um, to, uh, to the community? Through a negotiation among those who are going to be evaluating the strength and reliability of um, whatever estimate it is that we are uh, making. So it's not a context-independent relationship that holds simply between representation and object of representation, but rather is relative to context and to what communities seek to uh, accomplish with the information that they provide. So it's always going to be very uh, goal-centered. And it's not, you know, the, what they seek to accomplish may be cognitive. It doesn't have to always be practical in the sense of uh, materially engaging with the world. Our goals may be cognitive and theoretical, but um, they may also be practical and um, as theoretical goals. They may, they may also vary. We may want to understand the potential coherence of a particular theory with, with uh, some other body of theory. Um, our practical goals vary uh, all over the place. So um, these are decisions. So what those goals are, decisions that are made, made socially. So um, why, why does any of this matter? Well, um, one way that it um, matters, uh, I think, is in um, thinking about the public understanding or appreciation uh, of science and its cognitive authority. Um, I feel this especially 
in the United States. Um, I don't know what the situation uh, is like here, but I think the percentage of the U.S. population that believes that climate is changing and that humans have something to do with that is gradually increasing, but it's been way below 50% for a long time. Uh, people who profess themselves to be uh, uh, proponents of intelligent design are alarmingly, uh, it's an alarmingly high percentage of the population. As you may know, if you follow, follow these things, we even have uh, candidates for the presidency who uh, will profess not to believe in evolution. <laughs> Well, um, this is actually, this is concerning. Um, and I think that uh, one of the, if you, if you think about the ways in which, um, say, science was defended against the creationist pose, one of the problems, I think, in the way science was defended, both by scientists and by philosophers, was by promising too much. That, that, that's, that science really is the only, it's the best way to acquire knowledge. Um, science was attributed to a certain kind of certainty. Um, uh, the potential for certainty that other forms of knowledge production uh, didn't have. Um, and um, I think cognitive authority, if it may, is made to rest on promises of certainty, is going to be, always going to be undone. Just for the reasons that, that just the value of luck over this, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, so I think certainty is really inappropriate for the evaluation of scientific evidence. Um, and exact mirroring is not the criteria <coughs> by which representations should be evaluated. To promise or demand uh, either of these is to set a standard relative to, to, to which science is guaranteed to fail. So I think our role as philosophers of science is really to make the complexity uh, of scientific knowledge uh, more uh, uh, comprehensible to uh, the non-scientific and non-philosophical public, um, as well as maybe helping to provide them with some tools to understand and um, uh, themselves come to certain assessments about scientific uh, investigation as opposed to other forms of coming to, uh, coming to beliefs. Um, but um, it's our, our role, I think, is to provide a more realistic conception of what the sciences can and do uh, achieve um, and uh, provide the tools by which members of the public who, in the end, in, uh, in an ideal democratic context, uh, are the ones who make decisions about how to use the knowledge that's, that's produced. Um, these are tools that we do have. Anyway, thank you very much. Questions. Thank you for your very interesting talk. Um, I wonder if um, the problem of underdetermination isn't even more serious than you uh, acknowledge. Um, it isn't just given any theory, any accepted theory, um, there are always going to be other theories that fit the, the evidence just as well. Much worse, there are always going to be endlessly many theory, other theories that are, fit the evidence even better than the theory we accept. Um, take physics. Take any accepted theory in physics, and Tony, take quantum theory, whatever you like. Um, there, are, there are always <coughs> lots of phenomena um, which are such, uh, you know, the theory applies to these phenomena, but we can't solve the equation, so we can't derive prediction. Um, there are going to be other phenomena where the theory on the face of it is refuted. I mean, maybe it isn't because we haven't done the experiments properly or the observations, but there's a clash. And then there are going to be other hypotheses, <coughs> uh, independent hypotheses, um, that are independently corroborated about other phenomena. Now, given the theory, we can now construct another theory, in fact, endlessly many theories, which, where, where we couldn't solve the equations, we just, mod where the theory is successful, we uh, leave it alone. Where the theory, where we can't solve the equations, we just take the empirical laws and stick them in and, and make them a part of the postulates about new theory. Uh, where the theory is ostensibly refuted, 
we just take the refuting phenomena and put them in as axioms of the theory. And then as far as the other uh, independent, the corroborated uh, hypotheses are concerned, we add those on as additional postulates of the theory. So this theory isn't refuted where the other theory is. It has much more empirical success. It reproduces all the empirical success of the earlier theory. And uh, we can always concoct endlessly many such theories, um, empirically more successful than the theories we accept. They never get considered for a moment. Why not? And this seems to me to be the really important point about undetermination, because they're horribly, horribly complicated. And what this highlights, it seems to me, is that there are always these two requirements for theory acceptance, especially in clear in physics, namely sufficient empirical success and sufficiently unified, sufficiently explanatory. Both requirements are essential. Uh, and, and the second one is We're coming to a question next. so important, <laughs> I'm coming to it, yeah. so important that it can override empirical success. And if we are persistently only ever accepting unified theories, even though there are these disunified rivals that are empirically more successful, that, it seems to me, uh, means that there is a big assumption, a metaphysical assumption, built into the whole enterprise of physics of science, a very problematic to... assumption, and so we really need a new conception of science. And it seems to me that that's the real, really important lesson to be learned from un under determination. Is this okay, let's leave it there and let them <laughs> Okay, well, well, I tried to provide a, a, an alternative conception uh, of science to the one that had been generally accepted at the time I started working. So yes, I agree that underdetermination um, requires a, some new conception of science. We have to kind of be clear about what conception it is we're rejecting and, and how it's going to be an improvement over, uh, how the alternative is going to be an improvement over the, uh, the old one. Um, uh, I agree. Um, I think, though, that um, uh, the, the kind of issue that you're uh, drawing attention to um, is part of that kind of holistic uh, understanding of underdetermination, which I agree persists. Um, but I think that, um, as well, for me, as someone who's concerned with um, uh, relations of science and society, I think that, and uh, I think that, focusing on these more local and um, Contemporary uh, issues of underdetermination um, are going to, um, I mean, they show us ways in which uh, we need to give more local uh, responses and more local analyses uh, of underdetermination um, for people who are concerned with contemporary science now. Uh, that was totally. Uh, mixed up, but I think, but I think there's a difference between focusing on these very mm, uh, global concerns that you're raising about the rationality of enterprise and looking in this more micro way, where it's not clear that there's even a single enterprise, uh, but rather a multiplicity of of enterprises which themselves take different forms um, in in the different disciplines, their different methodologies, uh, and so forth. Um, there is a kind of there is a kind of assumption um, that uh, uh, there is a kind of assumption of an ideal coherence um, that informs most of these most of these approaches. Nevertheless, in the end, uh, what's interesting to see is that they, in many cases, are partial uh, with respect to the phenomenon that they're trying to explain. So that's 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 the kind of issue that I'm that I'm trying to focus on, without denying the possibilities of, of, uh, of global underdetermination and the metaphysical issues that um, might attend, attend it. Uh, yes, thank you for your lecture. I have a question concerning the relation between empirical um, um, equivalence and observation. So if this concept of empirical equivalence, in a way, 
uh, changes the, the theory laden laden idea of observation we have so that we don't we don't just look for what we already know we or expect to see but we also have a very peculiar set of things that are just in this moment there and that cannot be reproduced. Because I was thinking about the case study you provided with Galileo and you said uh, actually then uh, we won't be able to observe again what he observed. While I had always thought uh, nobody was able to observe what, what Galileo observed before Galileo mm -hmm. but after him we would be able to kind of set in his um, kind of set of mind and in a way try to observe what he observed. Whereas it, with this concept of empirical equivalence uh, playing with, with observation, it seems that there is not just in observation what we want to see, but there is also some other kind of uh, material part of observation which matters a lot. And so I wanted to ask you if you could say something more on this. Um, uh, <laughs> yes, okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about, entirely what it has to do with empirical equivalence because um, the, I first brought this up, I think, um, in connection with the yeah, yeah, argument against um, the permanence of empirical equivalence. But, but yeah, so in my gloss uh, of what they're saying, which I don't think I agree with, right? Um, what they're saying is that you know, what is taken to be observed and observable in different scientific periods changes so that there isn't just a constant uh, set of measurements that provides um, uh, a, a base uh, for the evaluation, uh, the relative evaluation of hypotheses. Galileo's telescopes made possible uh, the observation of what we now identify as um, uh, the sh uh, sh uh, a shadow on Venus, um, uh, mountains on the moon, uh, the uh, moons of Jupiter. Um, but what he saw was not nearly as uh, clear as what can be observed. Uh, what can be observed now? We can probably observe. We certainly observe uh, features of Jupiter much more. Uh, fine brainedly than Galileo was able to, the same with the other observations that, that he made. So there's a sense in which it's the same thing. I mean, they were all, everybody was looking at the moon, and Ptolemaic astronomers saw Jupiter. I see Jupiter. If the night's clear enough or dark enough, I can see Jupiter and Saturn. And things. But, um, but what I see is not what I would see if I went to the, uh, uh, the telescope and put my eye to the telescope. I see something. <coughs> so, so what we, you know, what what a contemporary cosmologist is going to use is, and think about some of contemporary cosmology, and they're using radio telescopes and so forth. But the data that they're using are very different than what Galileo was able to achieve with his instruments. So it's the the change in instruments that changes what we uh, can use as data. And of course you might say, well, of course, you know, we're making assumptions about about the, the instruments, about the reliability of the instruments. Yes, they do. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've got personal interest in uh, complementary alternative medicine, and uh, a lot of them base their ideas around vitamin, which kind of relies on complexity and also kind of says that we don't know the answer because it's kind of implied ignorance how it runs. But increasingly they're drawing on scientific evidence or using sort of scientific research to validate their procedures and their practices. And I'm trying to create a dialogue such that it's transformative. What we present, um, or we, sorry, uh, as the kind of science presents itself as now kind of coming to terms with a lot of these kind of assumptions that we put it in, and then there is a sense of undetermination that's been built in to understand how we understand it. When we converse, they often use that to justify why they are correct with why you can't contradict or um, contrast with their kind of theories or practices. How would you suggest or what, what could you offer in terms of discussions around the anti-contamination to allow science and sort of more vitalistic or vital or something that kind of applies to a very complex or um, possibly undeterminable concept of healthcare or some other practice? How would you encourage what could you draw from this to kind of 
So, um, uh, one one thing I would 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 do is propose my uh, alternative to truth, for example, where that conveys the idea of a singular uh, a singular correct uh, representation, and move to uh, the notion of conformation and suggest that. Um, uh, conformation comes in degrees, it comes in respects, and we need, in order to have this dialogue, we need to be very clear about uh, the goals that each party has um, in conducting their, uh, their research. We need to be clear about the respects in which um, uh, conformation is sought, the degree to which conformation is sought. Um, I think that's the way to have uh, uh, dialogue across um, uh, very different um, uh, theoretical, practical uh, approaches to a, a phenomenon. Um, I, th I, I thought at one point you were going to be describing one of the abuses of underdetermination, where underdetermination, the fact of underdetermination, is appealed to as um, a reason for rejecting uh, a science altogether. Mm -hmm. I think that's not not the way to go. Um, just to, to kind of one of the um, interesting things in uh, my experience is that uh, famous chiropractor uh, people try to present information to them that they use that information they use a lot of uh, criticism of research or randomized control trials to justify where they shouldn't have to change their practice. Um, and so it's very readily on our end, or on the end of kind of more um, scientific practice, we can consider more scientific, to be able to adapt their process, but it's, it's very difficult and frustrating for uh, some people to try and match that in the other person. The transformation seems to happen here. The relationship doesn't always seem to change. Because communication with them over how they perceive their practices and so it kind of draws on this idea that you can't be determined that it is very complex or kind of um, has a bit of ignorance. It, it, yeah, I just, I just, I, 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 I don't want to accept the idea that complexity uh, leaves us powerless to, to say anything. Um, but I think that if we have unrealistic ideals for what counts as science, then complexity can uh, leave us powerless. If we have more realistic conceptions, then then we're not not powerless. And I think I think that the, the sort of the fact, the phenomenon of underdetermination can be abused. I think it's been abused by um, uh, uh, in, in climate science, for example, mm -hmm. um, uh, very much so. So. But I think the fact that it can be abused is another argument for actually being uh, upfront, not considering underdetermination something that we need to pretend doesn't exist, uh, or try to argue away in the way Loudon and Leplin do, but to face it full on and say, okay, how do the researchers deal with this in this in in in, in this uh, in this context? How do they do it in, in that context? So, so just empty emptily waving it under determination, I think, is. Irresponsible. Okay, we have a number of questions, so can we try and keep them as quick as we possibly can? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is a quick question, and it's just uh, it's about confirmation, uh, which I, I love the, the, the idea of it. But the uh, it's specifically about the kind of field of, of possibilities you mentioned, and the idea, the question I have, leaving truth aside, the notion of approximation and similarity are radically different from isomorphism or homomorphism. And I just wanted to see, I mean, the idea of being next to something, uh, approximation, or, or like something else is different from, of the same shape. Mm -hmm. um, so I just was wondering if you could respond to that issue of, of what is this collection of, of different possibilities and how do they fit together in a sense? Approximation versus uh, isomorphism. Okay, well, I mean, they're, they're meant to fit together in all um, uh, being, way, being relations that a representation may have to the object of representation. That's, uh, that's it. And uh, for some contents, for some kind of the contents, some of these um, uh, modes of epistemic appraisal or semantic appraisal may not work. So um, uh, if you're talking about um, In, in thinking about a model, for example, uh, what you may be most interested in is the structural 
which is going to be a homomorphism, a structural yes, similarity yeah. of uh, elements in the model to elements in the object of representation. Well, to me, it's the approximation and similarity that are the ones that stand out. This is potentially more problematic in terms of wealth. You can map shapes onto one another, perhaps, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. approximation just has this uh, something that's a bit more Loose. Well, it's loose. Yeah, it's, 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 it's loose. I mean, I'll, actually, my objection to approximation, I include it because, you know, many philosophers who say, well, truth is too strong, but really, mm -hmm. it's approximation that we're after. Um, the problem with approximation is that it sounds as though there is a tr an actual exactly. true value, exactly. and exactly. that we're just getting closer and closer. Right. Um, so, yeah. uh, that's, that's my problem. <clears throat> <laughs> um, with your grid, um, uh, with your behavior as your example, um, which I really, really liked um, as a case study, and um, how it kind of links back to this idea of making public um, um, understanding science, um, uh, you know, understanding of accessibility and stuff. Um, then I just wonder, um, like, if we get those groups up with the genome and the people who work in those different areas, then. Um, it's absolutely right, there needs to be this kind of democratic way of going about and working together to create this kind of overall idea. But then it's kind of also who makes up those groups who work in those kind of areas as like a problem. So I guess, for example, it might be that a certain type of dominant group make up the people who are doing it's a type of work on genome one, and less, and people who are, um, and people who make up, say, the group doing, I don't know, uh, the kind of, people are doing work on the environmental factors mm -hmm. or behavioral factors or like, the home care factors that might affect. Um, then it's kind of already with kind of the problem comes with who, who's already in those groups to kind of set a precedence of what is the most dominant group and then to form that all together and then give it back to society to then say, oh, well, which one of those groups are you going to say, which are they going to join um, as the most dominant members? Does that, does that, does uh, that well, I think so. I, I, I think so. Okay. I mean, I, I, yes. And one of the th Things that my uh, I didn't even talk about. Mm. Although, if I hadn't been watching the clock, I might have subjected you <laughs> to that part. Um, uh, one of the things that I think my account of, of objectivity in science mm. does, with its requirement of, of diversity, mm. is to in fact uh, challenge mm. those structures of dominance that too often characterize. Mm. Uh, disciplines and uh, individual subgroups mm -hmm. down to laboratories in those disciplines. If if what's required for uh, objectivity is the interaction of multiple perspectives, then uh, the perspectives that have to be included are the perspectives of the non-dominant and the marginalized, mm -hmm. as much as those of the of the dominant. So that's why, and and but that's that applies to sort of the, the structure of the investigative community. Um, and then we can think about whose responsibility it is to make sure that the community is actually structured in this inclusive rather than exclusive way. Thank you. Two quick questions. Um, do you think that your discussion has any implication for debate about interdisciplinarity um, and perhaps SDR specifically? Um, and then the second question, do you think, is there any contradiction between the ambition of um, generating an account, as you were saying, that it's a, an account of science, that it's realistic, and at the same time upholding this idea that um, this norm of objectivity, that there has to be an equality of intellectual authority? Because the sociological critique is that it's impossible. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if you do want to provide a realistic account of what science provides, you do need to take into account power structure. Yes, so absolutely. Do you think there's a absolutely. But, but those, the norms that I propose, which of course I didn't talk about, um, uh, are, 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 are uh, designed to show that a community that is structured by relations of power is not reliable. Mm -hmm. So it can't be trusted to provide objective knowledge in the sense that I've um, outlined it. So I think norms are. You know, the, the, the sociologists can, can describe mm -hmm. the structures. I think, though, that um, when we're talking about, about issues of knowledge, mm -hmm. issues of reliability, we're already importing norms. 
And the question is, what are the norms that are going to, that if observed, are going to guarantee such things as objectivity and reliability? Uh, so to say that there are norms is not to say that they're satisfied. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Another first question. Another first question. That, Interdisciplinary. Does it have anything to do, do you think it has anything to do with your discussion? Uh, and especially the demands for interdisciplinary. Uh, yeah, well, we have to be careful about those demands. Um, because uh, when they come from above, um, sometimes they're just um, policymakers latching on to uh, tag words uh, and popular ideas without having any idea what they're talking about. So, uh, and, at my institution, there's lots of talk about interdisciplinarity, but you know, there's no way to actually realize it because we're all in departments, we're all evaluated in departments, we're evaluated by how much we, we produce uh, in uh, our dis disciplines. So what do you think about so what STS? Do I, about STS? STS well, I think STS, I think STS is terrific, actually, because it's... Right. <laughs> <laughs> because it is, it is a venue in which... Um, people pursuing uh, understanding of a common phenomenon, which is very complex and requires multiple approaches to, to uh, fully uh, capture, that's a venue in which, um, which permits uh, interaction uh, among, among the disciplines. And it permits someone pursuing um, sociology, for example, to acknowledge that the sociological work is not itself going to be complete. And the philosopher is going to acknowledge that the philosophical work is also partial. Um, so, but it's a way to understand the ways in which our <coughs> approaches actually are partial, what it is that we miss. Um, um, and the other point about interdisciplinarity, of course, is that the sciences have been on interdisciplinarity for a long time. And the the sciences, um, uh, and they get support for interdisciplinarity in a way that uh, the more humanistic disciplines don't, because interdisciplinarity in the sciences has been pragmatically useful. Whereas our, we, you know, we, are, we are cognitively useful and we are politically useful in ways that not everybody may welcome. <laughs> so, thank you. I think that your conclusions are, are really nice. Um, I was, you mentioned that you're specifically focusing on the biology case study. I was wondering if it could sound you out on your intuitions on how much your CCE sort of schema might apply to mathematics and logic. Or if you think that those are somehow special. Um, uh, well, well, okay. It, as long as I only have to talk about my intuitions, yeah. <laughs> and then argue, that's fine. Um, um, because I do think, um, I, I do think that. Well, I, I, I guess I would say yes and no. Um, I think that um, there are. Certainly, I know that researchers who study mathematics um, will, some of them, will focus on the, the social dimensions of, of mathematics and the ways in which um, uh, uh, mathematicians uh, don't just uh, collaborate, but the ways in which a, a, a proof doesn't count as a proof until it's been uh, gone through by uh, by another set of eyes and so forth, so that there is that kind of interactive dimension um, to mathematics. And as long as there's that interactive dimension, I would say that my CCE norms uh, would, would apply um, because they're about um, having venues for interaction, standards that are generally accepted, uh, and most importantly, quality of, of, of what I call intellectual authority. So yes, I think that those would apply. And if you have somebody who's uh, looking through somebody's proof who has greater uh, institutional power and also has their own little solution um, on the side, um, I'm, we're not necessarily going to trust the review that that person gives of the graduate students um, coming up with the proof. So even though the representation of mathematics is that it is somehow this pure, pure discipline where the only thing that counts is um, uh, the calculus. The, 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 yeah, the, the construction of proofs and, and so forth. I think that it is as much a social uh, activity as uh, as the sciences are. That's my intuition. Thank you.
Yes, so, so I had actually the picture mentioned that you had partial release on that, which was to a certain extent I got the notion that you wanted to really shift the grounds of the discussion about under determination from kind of questions of proof, causality, towards ideas of um, confirmation, plurality. And I, I was especially struck by your conclusion when you spoke about the uh, cognitive authority of science and was to a certain extent wondering to what way this shifts the relationship between philosophy of science and science for you. In a similar way, maybe if you take Formula 2 or also, not so recently anymore, about uh, climate change, that kind of we have criticized science so much, actually now we have to side with science mm -hmm. in a certain mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that for climate change, the question is not only kind of between evidence and theory, but even the evidence that science furnishes to a certain extent is put into the question. So it's about the image of science within society and the place of science in society. And do you see there a reconfiguration of the role, of the role of philosophy of science and science that made the humanities and society? Well, it depends on what we took the role to, to be in the first place, whether or not I'm thinking about a reconfiguration. Um, but I mean, to the extent that I think of philosophy of science as, as an interpretive discipline, uh, interpretive of the human practice of doing science, um, and uh, I see it as a mediator um, between the, the practice of scientists and, and the more general public, um, who for whatever reason don't have direct access. Um, we have a division of labor. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's, that's a fact of, of, uh, of, of modern life. Not everybody uh, can develop the expertise that's required to do calculations as are involved in climate change, for example, or any other uh, complex discipline. So we have a division of labor. Um, I think philosophers of science have, uh, and many uh, individuals in the SDS, um, have an interpretive role to play, um, both um, in, uh, yeah, uh, have an interpretive role to play by not just delivering the results of, of science to the public, but rather giving the public the tools to be itself more engaged in, in the scientific process. Not, and you have one, one sole facility to do this, so this idea of negotiation is, is very complicated here, but mm -hmm. in, this, in this sense, we, um, do you see this experiment being conducted in a different way, or some improvements to be made? Um, to be honest with you, uh, although I, I, I heard about the, the experiment that supposedly showed us that there actually are gravitational waves of low these many years, of uh, trying to trying to find and measure them, um, I don't know enough about the details of the experiment mm -hmm. to answer that question. Um, I'd need to, to answer it. I would want to look at um, things like just the reports from the um, from the researchers about the experiment that was done, um, uh, maybe the statistical methods that were that were used. Um, before I had much to say that, that addresses your question. You're the one who knows about gravitational waves, so that's, that's what you have to do. <laughs> and, and, and I guess asking in the larger context of, of big data, and for example, the Higgs boson and, and all these yeah. l l large experiments mm -hmm. in large facilities, mm -hmm. which do, do not have much room for replication or for challenging what would is mm -hmm. observed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, the, co the, cost, the cost of doing some of this science makes uh, certain traditional features of uh, scientific method, like replicability, uh, almost prohibitive. So, but what do we do about that? What this brings to my mind is that the notion of inductive risk is an old idea, first introduced by by Richard Rudger, who said that the, uh, uh, the consequences of being wrong determine how strong, or should determine how strong our evidence has to be before we reject or accept an hypothesis. The thing is, it's not clear what the consequences of being wrong about gravity waves are, as opposed to being wrong about um, some medical uh, intervention. 
So we're going to want demand a higher mm -hmm. standard of evidence for the medical intervention than we are for gravity waves. So we'll be really excited by that one experiment that's really expensive. Um, um, and maybe we'll just leave it at that um, until uh, there are more challenges to you know, the, uh, the standard model, for example, that may make us rethink uh, what the experiment will be showing. Okay, well, I think we've ground you for long enough, but thank you very much. Well, thank you very much.